when Westerners went over to Thailand to study with the Great Ajans, they often found they had problems with the heat and the bugs and general hardships. And the Ajans would teach them a lot about equanimity and patience. So much so that in some cases that seemed to be the only message that got through. This may be why we sometimes hear craving the cause of suffering defined as wanting things outside to be different from what they are. The implication being that if you accept things as they are and are okay with things as they are, then you're not going to suffer. All you need is some contentment, some patience, some equanimity. But when the Buddha explained craving, it was something much deeper than that. The equanimity that comes from just accepting things in the senses, the Buddha called worldly equanimity. And there are two stages that were higher than that. There was the equanimity that comes from getting the mind into good concentration. And then there's the equanimity that comes as a result of finding true happiness. You look at the rest of the world, and the fact that things are not the way you want them to be, you're perfectly fine with that because you've found something deeper and more satisfying inside. But the craving that has to be overcome in order to find that goes a lot deeper than just craving for things to be different from what they are. And the Buddha defined it as a craving that leads to further becoming. Now the term further becoming basically refers to the processes that lead to rebirth. And that seems to be the Buddha's main focus. After all, as a young prince, that was the main reason he went off into the woods to begin with, seeing that it was subject to aging, illness, and death. And he didn't know, is there something that is not subject to aging, illness, and death? He wanted to find it so that he wouldn't have to suffer at the moment of death. He wouldn't have to suffer from death at all. And you can imagine the cravings that come at death. They're a lot stronger than wanting to be away from the heat or the bugs. The Buddha identified them as three. There's craving for that sensuality. And that's craving to fantasize about sensual pleasures. And of course, from that craving comes the desire to find those sensual pleasures. And that goes very deep. You can be perfectly okay for a while with things being the way they are outside, as long as you get to fantasize. But that opens a huge Pandora's box at the moment of death, when the mind can't stay here in the body, when this being that we've created out of our attachment to the aggregates has to move on. If it hasn't uprooted craving for sensuality, it's going to go for sensual pleasures of almost any kind. Then there's craving for becoming itself, to be a being in a particular world. And when you find that you can't be a being in this world anymore, you're going to be evicted. If you haven't overcome this craving, it's basically the raw craving to be a being, you're going to grasp at anything, any identity that opens itself up to you. And given that we're driven by craving at that time, this can go anywhere. Then there's the craving for non-becoming, which is basically to annihilate what you are, the world you're in. Of course, suicide would be a prime example of that, but there's other ways of trying to obliterate yourself. The people who drink themselves to oblivion. The people just want to destroy the world they're in. They don't like what they've got. They'd like just to blow it all up. 
Of course, if you have that kind of craving, that too becomes a craving that will carry you on. Usually towards some pretty obliterated states. So these are very strong, deep-rooted cravings that we've got to work with here. We have to keep that perspective in mind. Because all too often the present, Buddhism has become the religion of the present moment. As long as you're okay in the present moment, that's all that's asked. Don't worry about what happens after after death. In fact, there's some versions of Buddhism now that say, well, we have to leave it as a big mystery. The whole point of the Buddha's teaching was to solve that mystery. He didn't want to leave any stone unturned. After all, he's the Buddha, the one who knows. And one of the things he came to know was how beings die and are reborn in line with their actions. And their actions, of course, are driven by their cravings. So we come to the present moment not because it's the goal of the practice, but because it's the place where we get to work on the skills that we're going to need at the moment of death. So we can see our cravings clearly right here, right now. This is one of the reasons why we create this state of becoming, state of concentration. You fully inhabit the body. Don't let there be any ectoplasms of your brain or your mind leaping out someplace else. Be aware of your head in your head, your hands in your hands, your feet in your feet. In other words, try to give all your awareness of the body a sense of equality. No one spot has to take predominance over the others. Or if there is one spot, it shares the spotlight with everybody else. And fully inhabit this. It's good to create a sense of well-being so that you feel good being here and are not likely to want to go away. And then you can watch as other potential becomings come up. As the becomings on the large scale that take you from one life to the next start in the mind, in these small-scale becomings, as a thought world appears. And there's some drive to go into it. Watch out for that drive. Try to nip it in the bud. And you'll find it starts complaining. Can I have a little bit of pleasure? Can I have a little bit of whatever? And you have to regard it in the same way that the monk Sundara Samuda regarded a vision he had. He was walking medit doing walking meditation one day and this, had this vision of this beautiful woman at the end of the path, inviting him to disrobe, saying, Now that you're still young, you should enjoy sensual pleasures. Wait until you're old, then you can come back and become a monk, I'll be and I'll become a nun. And he said he looked at her and he saw her as a trap of death laid out. So that's how you should regard your distractions here as you meditate. If you find it easy to slip off into a distraction while you're young and healthy, relatively well, what's going to be like when you're at the moment of death? Contentment, acceptance, patience, equanimity are not going to cut it at that time. They make it easier. I mean, people who accept the fact that they're dying have a huge advantage over the ones who refuse to accept it. But there's a lot more that needs, needs to be done. You have to comprehend craving. We talk about the different duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths, but there is one passage where one monk, Guampadi, says he heard it from the Buddha. You try to comprehend all four of the Noble Truths. After all, how are you going to abandon craving until you comprehend it? Of course, in developing the path, that's how you comprehend the path as well. So look at this as an opportunity to understand your cravings. These are the things that will carry you on. 
and they mean business. They may seem playful, lots of fun. But they can lead you into all kinds of places where you don't want to go. Think of those Brahmas in one of the stories about how the universe evolves. After the universe, the previous universe had devolved, and there were these Brahmins way up in the higher heavens. And then the new universe begins to form. And so they come down and they, and they move along over the waters. And they see a film on the water. They say, What's that? It looks delicious. And so one of them who's wanton tastes it with his finger. And so it tastes like a combination of ghee and wild honey. And so he sets on it, and the other ones see him. So they tr set on the film too, and they start eating and eating and eating, breaking it up with their hands. And as they do, they, they lose their luminosity. And that's the beginning of the fall. So this is symbolic, by the way, in which a lot of becomings seem appealing at the beginning. And part of the mind says, well, hey, what about this? I haven't tried this one in a long time. And then you fall for it, and you fall way down. The more you go after it, the more you change. So you have to watch out. Cravings can take us all kinds of places. The Buddha's image is of a fire going from one house to another. He clings to craving. Excuse me, the fire clings to the wind. In the same way, the mind clings to craving as it goes. We know what the wind is like. It can blow anywhere. So you want to train the mind so it's not fooled by any kind of craving. We do work with a desire to get the mind to settle down. We work with a desire to develop the path. But you have to hold to that desire and fight off everything else. Because it's only in that way that there can be some guarantee of safety for you. Craving may seem playful, but its consequences can be serious, and you have to take them seriously as well.